That's all we've got time for on this week's show, and I hope you've enjoyed this look at the Viewmaster Interactive Vision. Definitely the best of the VHS-based systems that we've looked at over the last few episodes. Of course, I did promise that this would be the last of the VHS-based episodes, so next week we'll be going back towards something far more normal, a little bit more mainstream. Definitely no more VHS-based consoles. So I think it's only right that we let him introduce himself. Uh, just tell us who you are and why you're here. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm I'm Matt, and I I think I might be addicted to um, VHS-based video games. Where did you find? I can explain. That's part of our found it. I, I, it's not. It's not what it looks like. It's. It's innocent. It, it's not. It, it, it clearly is it, what it looks like. It's no. That was you bought me that. Remember? <laughs> 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 Welcome to another overdue rental return and payment of extortionate late fees with Replay Retro. I'm Matt and okay, yeah, I lied. I'm doing another video about VHS based video games and at this point I'm pretty sure it's bordering on an addiction, but hey, at least it's content. Over the last few shows we've been looking at systems which used VHS cassette tapes as the storage medium for games. VHS was the primary home video format of the 70s, 80s and even the 90s before it was finally replaced by DVD at the dawn of the 21st century. So its large user base made it well placed to build a new video game format. With games able to offer a photorealistic experience instead of the blocky 8-bit graphics of the era. Industry pioneer and Atari founder Nolan Bushnell was one of the names behind this bold new frontier. Partnering with Hasbro to work on a project codenamed Nemo, this system would use special VHS tapes carrying multiple video sequences and data streams buffered by a separate console called the Control Vision. This would show the player the relevant footage based on their in-game actions, augmented by whatever graphics the machine generated. While this would eventually lead to successful games like Night Trap being released for a variety of CD-based gaming platforms, the VHS versions never came to fruition, as the machine was deemed too complicated and too expensive for production. We've already taken a look at Worlds of Wonder's light gun based Action Max console, as well as Sega's toy hybrid the Video Driver, both of which read flashing reference points on the screen and scored the player based on shooting or driving between the correct reference points. These relatively cheap systems are great to look at, undoubtedly catching the eye of anyone passing at a demo unit if their local store chose to display one. And on a first playthrough, they're genuinely fun. 
but their linear gameplay and absence of any real interactivity soon leaves them shelved as the player quickly gets bored of repeating the same footage over and over and over with nothing changing, regardless of how well or how badly they play. We've also seen Viewmaster's more complicated interactive vision, which used multiple audio tracks, embedded data, and overlaid graphics to create a far more interactive experience. It's still not Sewer Shark on the control vision, but it was definitely a step in the right direction. However, it wasn't just the big toy companies who wanted to get in on the action. The 80s were rife with copycat toys made by companies wanting a quick buck from the latest trend with one such company being founded in 1982 as Select Merchandise Incorporated. With offices in New York and production based in Korea and Hong Kong, Select produced cheaper versions of several successful toy lines, including Ninja Assassins figures aimed at Mattel's He-Man market, Muscle Mania targeting the little rubber muscle figures again produced by Mattel, Converters, a range of transforming toys, obviously going after that sweet Transformers money, and even Gabby Bear, an attempt to steal sales away from Worlds of Wonder and their hugely successful Teddy Ruxpin. And it's here, while keeping tabs on Worlds of Wonder, that Select may well have got the idea to develop a VHS-based light gun game called the Video Challenger to compete with the Action Max that they were working on. In fact, Select were also working on another VHS system announced at the 1986 New York Toy Fair called the Video Voyager, featuring two animatronic figures inside a spaceship which also doubled as a keyboard, though this never came to fruition. It's often mistakenly believed that Takara, the Japanese toy company famous for the Transformers, came up with the Video Challenger. However, in truth, it was Select who designed and developed the hardware whilst also creating the first two games, Space Challenge and Sky Wars, which used original footage and computer-generated graphics. There's no records on why Select never released the system themselves, however it could be that they simply lacked the finances to make it happen without help, or it could be that legal action from Worlds of Wonder over Gabby Bear led them to selling, or at least licensing, their assets to stay afloat. Nevertheless, in 1987, Takara released the Video Challenger in Japan, with one packed-in game. Though it's worth noting that on early versions, the Select merchandise name is very clearly moulded onto the handle, as well as visible on the packaging alongside the Takara logo. So it may well be that Select did in fact handle production, while Takara simply acted as a distributor. The system would then be released in Italy by G.I.G., Canada by Irwin, and in the UK by Bandai, where it retailed for £55, though was quickly discounted in the Argos Christmas catalogue to just £37.95. Having Takara and Bandai on board turned out to be a great boost to the system, as both utilised their licences to bring branded content to the platform. Bandai treating us to a UK exclusive Teenage Mutant Hero Turtle game, while Takara added game-compatible targets to Godzilla, allowing players to take on the Scourge of Tokyo in two games. Takara even made the title sequence to the 1987 Transformers The Headmasters series compatible with the Video Challenger as well as a few battle scenes within the show, giving owners a short Transformers-themed shooting session for free. Look closely and you'll even see the Transformers human ally, Daniel, carries a Video Challenger gun, showing that Takara were well behind this product. A quick look at the gaming press suggests that there may have also been plans to create interactive versions of movies, with magazines like The Games Machine quoted as saying, imagine being able to shoot it out with Gary Cooper at high noon, or take on a MiG piloted by Clint Eastwood. Before going on to claim that this was something the American developers were already chasing down, even before the machine had been released. While there's little information about the hardware itself, the presence of a COP420 chip confirms an 8-bit CPU, 1K of ROM and 32K of RAM. The configuration of this specific chip version, the TDX-N, is likely bespoke to the Video Challenger, and so it's hard to be sure, but it's believed to be based on a Hitachi HD401010 processor running at 4MHz. 
When the player pulls the trigger, the video challenger reads cues from the on-screen target based on the frequency and pattern of blinking lights, much like the Action Max. However, unlike the Action Max, the video challenger is capable of differentiating between several different types of blinking to add or remove different amounts of points. Furthermore, it continues to read the screen when the trigger isn't pulled, allowing the cassette to return fire on the player. Yet another function lacking from the Action Max. And while this doesn't overcome the repetitive nature of VHS-based games, it definitely adds an extra layer to it, incentivizing repeat plays to improve your score, and making the game much more like a modern arcade title such as Time Crisis, where the player must duck to avoid being hit. Because all of the required hardware is built into the control itself, with the obvious exception of the VCR, there are no cumbersome wires, and playing in multiplayer is easy, with players able to bring their own video challenger and all fire on one screen. They can then instantly compare scores thanks to the simple readout on the back of the blaster. It actually feels a lot like a home version of those theme park ghost trains with the guns, such as the duel at Alton Towers, where players shoot at a series of animatronic and stationary targets while travelling through the ride. All things considered, the Video Challenger would appear to be a significant improvement over its main rival from Worlds of Wonder. So, could select merchandise be onto a winner? Could the knockoff merchant actually beat a toy giant? We'll find out after we take a look at the hardware itself and a few of the games. When it comes to the hardware itself, the Challenge Blaster is exactly what you would expect. It is just a toy light gun. Doesn't look anything like a game system really at first glance. You're not going to find any sockets, any inputs or outputs on this as there is nothing for it to connect to. It doesn't need to connect to your TV and there is no external console for it either. Nor does it need to connect to other guns for multiplayer because the multiplayer is entirely wireless. However many friends you have, however many friends you can sit around the TV, and however many of them have a video challenger, that is the number you can play together. Which is much better than the Action Max offering just one player, because I suppose technically the video challenger offers an infinite number of players, as long as you can all get round the TV. The design itself is pretty cool, really. It is very 80s, 90s sci-fi, and you've got these go faster stripe embellishments and an extremely late 80s, early 90s logo there, which I, I really like that aesthetic. It works well. If you have the Japanese version, then the handle will either say Takara Co. Limited or it might say Select Merchandise, depending on which version you have. But as far as I'm aware, all of the versions released outside of Japan are completely plain like this. However, on the other side, you do find an embossed made in China, as well as all the screw holes like you would expect to find on these single side build items. You also get the power switch on the side, which we'll flick to on, and so now when we pull the trigger, we get that extremely 80s, 90s toy space gun sound effect that for me instantly brings back a huge number of memories of countless cheap plasticky space toys. And it also brings on the score display on the back, which is a six digit display with the usual uh, numeral system that you would expect to find in anything of this era. But it's really nice and bright. It is a really vivid display and I'm glad the camera seems to be picking that up well. Um, yeah, it's a really nice display. Looking down the site you can see there is a little target reticle and if you are hit then a little explosion effect will light up in there too, which again is another cool piece of feedback. Obviously when that happens your score will also go down and you get a different sound effect to let you know that's happened. If we look further down the barrel you can see that there is an LED here. It's like a, a greeny yellowy LED. And looking around we can see the lens and somewhere down about here inside the barrel is where you have the photo sensor which allows the system to detect what's going on on the screen. On the bottom, of course, we do need power, so we have a battery bay. 
where we find four AA batteries. This bay can be a little bit tricky to get closed again at times. You do have to give it a little bit of a wiggle as the batteries are, of course, spring-loaded. There we go, that got that done. That took a lot less time in this take than it did in the previous one. And yeah, that is basically it. It's a remarkably simple device. If we leave it sat on the counter for a little while, it will eventually beep to let us know that it has been left turned on uh, without being played for a while, which is pretty good because as we all know, kids do like to leave stuff on and you don't want your batteries to drain and have to replace them because don't forget that photo sensor, even now, even when I'm not pulling the trigger, that photo sensor is scanning, looking for a target shooting at the gun. Popping it back down over here and taking a look at the games themselves. They of course come in standard VHS cases, exactly as you would expect. This is the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles game from Bandai and yes, it is the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles because obviously here in the UK, ninjas were too violent for us, we couldn't handle it. It would be panic on the streets at the thought of, hero, uh, of Ninja Turtles. But Hero Turtles, that's completely acceptable. You can see that this is copyrighted 1988, so just a little while after the release of the system itself. And this is a completely original Turtles episode, as far as I'm aware, which is pretty cool. And this game was only released here in the UK, so it is an exclusive, which does seem weird for a system that was obscure enough anyway, but more so over here. Nothing special on the inside, just the usual VHS cassette that I'm sure you've seen before. They all have pretty much the same label system on. And of course, when you're ready to play, there's nothing to connect. You simply pop the tape in your VCR and wait for the instructions. But of course, as you guys know, I haven't been using the actual cassette tapes in these episodes because the fact is, they are fragile. You can start to see bits of mold and dirt on the tape itself. And the truth is, they're just really dirty. You wouldn't get a good enough quality image. So we will switch over to streaming a digital image from the computer to this TV and check out the gameplay. So the first game that we'll take a look at then is the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles Turtle Challenge. And it's going to be quite difficult, I think, to hit targets while trying to keep the score display on camera, but I will try. Most games start with an explanation of target scores like this, saying what things score what points. On some games you can hit these ones, on others you can't hit them until it goes to the practice session. Which does seem weird, but there you go, it is letting me hit. So that point you can see is worth 500. If you hit the 500 several times in a row, you do go into like a bonus multiplier and you'll earn points faster. However, other targets, as you can see, take points away from you. So we did lose some points for hitting the weird straw baguette man. Then you have the proper practice session. See if I can hit anything aimed this way. It's a bit difficult not being able to aim while checking that it's on the screen. Whereas if I aim over here, I can reliably hit. That siren means the multiplier is on because I hit five targets in a row. see the sound of the gun changes as well uh, but I got hit then so you can see we finished the practice session with uh, 11,400 points when I hit a target I do get a, a red flash there oh. and when I get hit you get a yellow flash instead Okay, so we need to reset the gun, ready for the game. 
The game is obviously much harder than the practice session. What do you think of my latest invention? It's, uh, well, Donatello. Yeah, Tubuloso! Yeah, but like, what's it do? It's a super fast pizza maker. It cuts cooking time in half. So you can see, I need to try and hit these pizzas. They're worth 100 points each, but then I got the multiplier. So they're worth more, but then I struggled to hit any more. So I got 500 points. And the story basically continues on from there. I think you get the general idea. So let's take a look at another game. Next up then we have Space Challenge, which is one of the Select Merchandise original games. Again, this did start with a practice session, but I have skipped that for now. I don't know if you can see the red. It's really difficult to hit while making sure the targeting reticle is on camera. Oh, there you go, I got hit. So you can tell that noise is obviously the sound of me hitting something. That is the sound of me missing. And if we get hit at some point in a minute, then you'll hear the sound again of me being hit. Score there so that you do know things are happening. 7,100. That's a hit. That's the multiplier bonus. So that, that's now a new missed sound. It is really difficult trying to capture the uh, hit effect in the viewfinder. Now you might just see a flash of it there. But yeah, you can see that this does actually work pretty well. So yeah, let's take a look at one more game. Yes, here's a game you'll recognise. Maybe under a different name, Road Protector or Road Avenger or whatever it decided to call itself that particular week. I don't know what you're thinking. How do you convert Road Avenger to a light gun? Well, my friend, the answer is you don't. So it's showing us that we can shoot bits of cars. But there's also scoring for steering and... Yeah. Uh, see, look. Got 300 points for vaguely shooting in the direction it wanted us to go. Essentially, this is just using recorded footage of the game with some overlaid stuff. Oh, I got hit there. So yeah, that is Road Blaster. 
Despite a promising start, strong licenses and undoubtedly better hardware than its more expensive rival, the Video Challenger failed to establish any better traction than the Action Max. In the end, only 8 games were released priced at £10 each, with these being a mixture of original content, existing footage with added compatible target graphics, and even recorded footage from other games with target graphics added on, such as a version of Sega's classic Afterburner 2. Sadly, the Video Challenger is probably the victim of being caught in a confusing space between toy and video game, not really belonging fully to either. While it may not have set the industry ablaze, it definitely deserves some praise for offering players the chance to shoot it out at home against live action targets who could actually shoot back, three years before the likes of Mad Dog McCree would hit the arcades in 1990. And maybe that's what the system needed. An actual shootout against an actual human opponent, something only the video challenger, powered by the VHS format, could really offer, but something it was never given. Whether that was a missed opportunity, or it wouldn't have made any difference, I'll leave to you to decide. In an ironic twist of fate, Mattel, who had been the victim of select knockoffs several times before, would actually go on to release their own VHS-based system under their Captain Power brand, with a spaceship instead of a gun, kind of merging both Select's Video Challenger and Video Voyager's ideas together. While some of the moulds from Select's Converter's toy range would go on to be used by Hasbro to create additional Transformers toys within the official line. Select merchandise themselves, however, would fade into obscurity, leaving very little by way of a paper trail. In the 90s, Takara would go on to publish several video games, including the Japanese release of Earthworm Jim 2 on the Mega Drive, as well as developing several ports of Neo Geo arcade games, including Fatal Fury on the SNES, before merging with Tomy in 2006. Bandai would go on to take another crack at full motion video games with their Playdia console in 1994, before partnering with Apple in 96 to release the Pippin, with neither machine really making any impact on the market. 1999 saw the release of their Wonderswan handheld, which undoubtedly did better, but along with its successors, that never left Japan. That's all we've got time for on today's show, but don't forget you can keep in touch via Twitter or using our Facebook page, and you can even support the show on Patreon. And of course, as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. When it definitely won't be another VHS-based system. Unless I can get hold of some Captain Power or Battlevision stuff.